Good evening. Tonight, the Fortress of Chanted Fins is in disarray after suffering serious losses. In the aftermath of multiple forgotten beast attacks and a serious close call with a siege, the militia is in shambles. Our walls are tall and sturdy, but we have few soldiers to man them. Yet more unsettling, Zasit the Necromancer, once the proud mayor of our fortress, is now an unfeeling, reanimated something. She's barely alive, lying in a pool of her own pus, as the doctors try to stitch her mangled body back together. The fortress is left leaderless and uncertain. This is a tumultuous time for the Ship of Saints, but we must stay the course. The worshippers of Tig the Lustful do not fear death, and their will cannot be so easily broken. As the dwarves return to the caverns, they find the remains of a colossal monster. The mangled chitin of Nomar does Ludthadel no Huskalar, the forgotten beast. It was a towering one-eyed spider. It had a round shell and appeared to be emaciated. Its maroon exoskeleton is warty. It had a poisonous bite. This thing must have fought with Sekel Seraklur at Clisto Nul and met the same fate as our soldiers. The body is long dead and rotted away, but the chitin is impressive. We've hauled it up to the Church of Lust and put it on display. We're also displaying the bones of the flying creature we shot down during the last siege. These Pillar Love's fists, created by necromantic experimentation long ago, are a grim and fascinating look at the wonders of necromancy. The bones are also covered in Sakel's Forgotten Beast Extract the same substance that caused paralysis and suffocation in our soldiers. When we were fighting Sakel, much of our equipment was coated in the stuff, including, apparently, some of our crossbow bolts. One of our artifact spears was also coated in the extract, which makes it an extremely deadly weapon. Though, the toxins are probably going to be washed off in the rain or in one of our mist generators sooner or later. Poisoned blades aren't the only way we are enhancing our militia. Most all of our wasting stalkers have petitioned for citizenship at this point. We've reorganized the Gilded Gears Squad and renamed it to the Gilded Graves. It now consists of eight of these powerful undead warriors. Many of them were highly trained soldiers in life, and they have retained their skills in undeath. Equipped with maces, spears, and axes, they are a force to be reckoned with. Just one highly trained wasting stalker is enough to strike down entire sieges. A whole squad of them will be devastating. Back in the world of the living, we've managed to scrape together a decent Marks Dwarf squad by drafting some of our less useful citizens, as well as a few migrants who recently showed up. Our few breathing melee dwarves have been transferred to the Pious Hand, formerly the Pious Blades, down in the caverns. They'll keep the common cave monsters from bothering our citizens, though we'll probably just send down the Gilded Graves if any serious threats like Forgotten Beasts attack. It seems that our concerns about the strength of the militia were unfounded. With so many wasting stalkers defending us, we're mightier than ever. Here in Chanted Fins, that which kills us makes us stronger. Since we're finally setting up a long-term garrison in the caves, we'll need access to the old food and drink storeroom down here. For years, we've had a giant cave spider locked up in there after the thing tried to attack our fortress. We're going to try to get it caught in one of these cage traps. We got him. Giant cave spiders can be a very valuable animal to have if you're careful. The dwarves are preparing a chamber for the creature up in the fortress, which will soon be ready. That project is going to need to be put on hold for a moment, though, because a vile force of darkness has arrived. The goblins of the Fell Witch have returned yet again, and they're really here in force. 63 goblins, 15 trolls, and a pack of beak dogs. To a regular dwarven militia, that would be a pretty worrying invasion force. Could just eight wasting stalkers really be enough to deal with all these invaders? The Gilded Graves are about to find out. They charge into the fray. The wasting stalkers are cutting through the goblins and trolls. Our most experienced soldiers are easily dodging all the attacks from the invaders, and quickly culling their numbers. Though, a few of the newer recruits are being overwhelmed. The wasting stalkers are clearly gaining the upper hand, though not without losses. 
At the end of it all, six wasting stalkers stand on a massive pile of viscera. Two of our soldiers were struck down by the invaders, but against such incredible numbers, that's still pretty impressive. Our citizens head topside to dispose of the carnage. Luckily, we have a chance at reviving someone, because Zasit is finally out of the hospital and has rejoined the fortress as a citizen. She's covered in nasty wounds and infections, but that doesn't seem to be slowing her down. She was immediately reappointed as mayor. Wasting stalkers don't feel emotions, but that doesn't actually stop them from being skilled conversationalists when they want to be. Zasit's incredible charisma allows her to easily win the election, just as she always has. Also, she's sporting a full head of unkempt hair after her reanimation, despite being bald in life, which is just bizarre. I guess that was Id's final gift to her. She's in the crypt now, ready to raise one of the bodies. Broken Brain was among those killed during the siege, but both his hands and feet were cut off during the fighting. Even if he maybe could be revived, I don't even think we would go that far. He's earned a final rest. We're opening the shutter now. The other corpse isn't raising either. It's too far damaged. It seems that both wasting stalkers have been deemed worthy by Tig the Lustful, and have been allowed to join her in the land of the dead. All of Tig's followers dream of the day they too will be granted that honor. With Zasit running the fort again, we can't help but wonder about the implications of her reanimation. If she experiences no emotions at all, what motivates her exactly? How does a person who feels absolutely nothing still have their own willpower? It's a question for the Dwarven scholars. In practice, she has retained most all of her skills, ethical leanings, and outward personality traits. She's still curious, ambitious, and polite. You could argue that she's simply emulating her behavior from when she was alive, trapped in her past habits, going through the motions. But whatever her internal experience, the practical effect is the same. She acts as the Zasit we've always known. There have been some slight changes to her behavior, though. In life, she used to despise warfare, an opinion she gained after birthing a child. Now, she doesn't have any opinion on war one way or the other. She may be more willing to send our soldiers to fight abroad now that she's less of a pacifist. Anyway, Zasit orders the workers to continue building up the tower. She still has big plans for the fortress. With the addition of some more migrants, the fortress is now populated by 105 dwarves. The Putrid Doctrine's religious order has welcomed many of these migrants into their fellowship, and they now have enough adherents in the fortress to anoint a high priest. We actually haven't assigned a regular priest to the temple since the death of the previous one, Udib Berlolam. We'll need to choose both a priest and a high priest for the Fatal Sanctum. For the regular priest, we are choosing Thakut Kibmor, Net Temple, a stone crafter. She was one of our starting seven dwarves, and she was romantically involved with Udib. Her relationship with him led her to believe that the world should operate in complete harmony without the least bit of strife or disorder and she's obsessed with order and structure in her own life. Anyway, she should be familiar with the duties of the priesthood. She has been anointed as the Sacred Filth. Our High Priest will be Sarvesh Takud Kubuk, Pick Lances, a 58-year-old blacksmith. He's one of the most devout zealots in the fortress, an ardent worshipper of Tig the Lustful. He views tranquility as one of the highest ideals, and is deeply offended by those who fail to maintain decorum. He isn't particularly ambitious, doesn't focus on material goods, and sees freedom and independence as completely worthless. Sarvesh also likes coffins, which seems quite fitting. This dwarf looks like he has the perfect mindset for a high priest. He's not distracted by ambition, wealth, or personal freedom. With tranquility and dignity, he will act as Tig's voice, and lead the fortress down her righteous path. He has been anointed as the First Mange. It's now early winter of the year 558, and we finally cleaned up most all of the corpses from the last siege. We built a trash smasher up on the surface to speed up disposal. That cut down hauling times, but all those months of carrying troll guts around were pretty rough on our dwarves. We now have 15 stressed citizens. That may seem overwhelming, but none of them are haggard, and I'm cautiously optimistic that we can de-stress them now that the work is done. We'll let the dwarves take it easy for a bit. We are further ramping up our clothing industry to help soothe our anxious citizens. Swapping out all their ratty hand-me-downs for some masterwork threads can help keep the dwarves happy. 
We've even started growing some dimple cups, a cave mushroom full of midnight blue pigments that can be used to dye cloth and thread. We have millers churning mushrooms into dye, and dyers coloring our thread and cloth. It will all help to make these new clothes as luxurious as possible. As we enter the tenth year of Chanted Fins, 559, we've mostly dealt with the stress problem. Of the fifteen dwarves that were stressed, only four haven't fully recovered. Of those, only two have high enough stress levels for me to be concerned. We're working to improve their moods, but their stress levels are still slowly increasing. They may become haggard and start causing problems in the fort. But dangers from below threaten to further complicate our plans. The forgotten beast, Ifebo Sapai Byretha, has come. An enormous three-eyed magpie. It has two long hanging tails and it undulates rhythmically. Its bronze feathers are downy. Beware its noxious secretions. This doesn't look like the most dangerous forgotten beast we've seen, but now doesn't seem the best time to fight it. We're going to try to just seal it away. And the cave is sealed. Ifebo is wandering the cavern now, killing off some cave crocodiles. Ooh, it just ran into a magma crab and got some pretty hefty burns. It's bleeding a lot. Another cave crocodile is attacking Ifebo now, and is doing some damage. Actually, I think the beast is injured enough that we should probably go in and kill it now. We might not get a better chance. The pious hand has gotten a lot of recruits recently, but they're all pretty green. So we'll just send down the gilded graves. Yes, they put down the creature pretty quick. That magma crab started a cavern wildfire, but it burns itself out before long. We now finally have some time to make use of our giant cave spider. We've set up a giant cave spider silk farm. When we lower the bridge shutter, the spider will see a target through the fortifications and spray them with webs. Then we close the bridge shutter to block off the spider's line of sight, allowing our weavers to collect the webs and weave them into valuable silk textiles. The design of the room is pretty similar to our necromancy setup. We'll have to use a dwarf as bait. They won't be in any actual danger, they're just going to stand around while the spider spews webs everywhere. Though it could be a rather stressful experience. We are releasing the shutter. Beautiful. A thick layer of giant cave spider silk webbing coats the floor. Our weavers are now collecting the webs and weaving them into silk. Giant cave spider silk clothes are a prized luxury that our dwarves will no doubt appreciate. It's now early summer. But the scorching sun isn't the only danger on the surface. A vile force of darkness has arrived. Another attack by the goblins of the Fell Witch. Looks to be near the size of the last siege. We're getting our civilians inside. For a few months, we've been collecting the enormous amount of armor the previous goblin siege left behind. A carpenter, Marul Balalfeb, is trying to carry a ridiculous haul back to the fortress. She's probably lugging four or five full suits of armor with her. And of course, she's moving at a snail's pace, with the goblins bearing down on her. We're trying to order her to drop it all. Alright, we finally coaxed her into ditching the gear. That was cutting it a little close. We're stationing both the Heavenly Rings and the Gilded Graves on our wall. The Marks Dwarves will be able to shoot down at the invaders, while the Wasting Stalkers might be able to use their force magic from up there. Looks like the goblins are staying just out of crossbow range. We could just send in the Gilded Graves to butcher them all, but that'd leave us with another huge pile of goblin corpses to clean up. I'd prefer to scare them off with Marks Dwarfs this time, but that'll only work if they get closer. They are all gathering on the beach. That gives me an idea. Alright, we're ready to go. We've spent the past month or two building a ballista, a huge artillery weapon that can launch enormous bolts with incredible force. It's most effective against groups of enemies on flat terrain, which is exactly what we are facing now. Our optics engineer, Phycod Kilrudzalud, also happens to be a competent siege operator, so she should be able to handle the thing pretty well. We're targeting the main bulk of the invaders. Fire at will, Phycod. A clean shot. It rips through goblins, trolls, and beak dogs. And another. Phycod's doing fantastic. Though she's no soldier. Seeing all the deaths she's causing is kind of getting to her, and she's in a bit of a panic. But she's pulling herself together. Phycod launches bolt after bolt, tearing into the siege with flying death. A small group of goblins is approaching the fort, close enough to scare away Phycod and prevent us from operating the ballista. That has put them in range of our crossbows, though, allowing our marks dwarves to pelt them with bolts. 
The wasting stalkers don't seem to be able to use their magic from this distance, though. Some of the goblins are backing off. Fikhod launches one more ballista bolt for good measure into the heart of the invasion force. We're out of ballista bolts for now, though. We'll need to assemble some more. The heavenly rings continue to punish any goblins that wander too close to the wall. But with so many of their number dead, the goblins finally decide to flee the fortress. Our ranged weaponry has proved to be a decent deterrent. We've broken the siege without leaving behind too much carnage. It has been a full season since the goblins showed up, so it took a while to send them off. But the cleanup is going to be pretty fast. The light touch seems like a better choice when stress is a concern. The dwarven caravan arrives, and the outpost liaison meets with Zasit. He tells us that the goblins of the Fell Witch haven't been sending out any attacks against the other dwarven sites over the past few years. The overwhelming power of our wasting stalkers seems to have diverted the attention of the goblins to chanted fins. They're throwing everything they have at us. We are certainly able to defend the fortress from whatever the goblins might conjure up, but perhaps it's time we started going on the offensive. It's doubtful we'll ever be able to take down their largest settlements, but we could certainly weaken their hold over the region. The giant Zathud Dalzatgigin Okashtesum has come. He charges across the beach towards the fortress, but the Gilded Graves have no trouble dispatching the interloper. Having these wasting stalkers around may be a bit unsettling, but the security they provide certainly comes with some peace of mind. One of our dwarves, Rakust Fightboards, has just created a pair of artifact steel greaves. She named them after herself. They're worth 241,200. The artifact is encrusted with marquee-cut red zircons, studded with steel, and encircled with bands of willow and alpaca wool. The object menaces with spikes of red zircon. On the item is an image of round pebbles in red zircon, an image of our native gold mechanism artifact in red zircon, and an image of this same pair of greaves in red zircon. This is an extremely useful artifact. We'll have to figure out who to give it to. Rakust herself is an adequate tactician, the best in the fortress. She doesn't have any other combat skills, but perhaps we ought to change that. We're putting her in the Pious Hand squad, and equipping her with those artifact greaves. If we're going to start sending attacks out against the goblins, having someone with tactical prowess on the battlefield will be helpful. She's equipping herself now. We'll give her a while to train before we start sending out attacks. While the rest of our citizens are completely free of stress, our two problem dwarves have finally become haggard. One of them has simply been wandering around depressed, not causing any problems. But the other, Onol Azumvush, has started throwing tantrums. Onol started a fistfight and really messed someone up. She punched a gem setter in the neck, shattering the spine's bone. Onol's not likely to get any better, either. She's in a constant state of internal rage. More events like this are bound to keep happening. Onol receives an order from Zasit to report to the crypt. The hatch is locked behind her. Near two months later, Zasit descends as well, though she doesn't return with a wasting stalker. All that's left of Onol is a mindless zombie. Tig takes another soul for herself. But our militia continues to expand nonetheless. With another wave of migrants, we now have 133 dwarves enchanted fins, enough to begin building another squad. The new recruits won't be useful to us for a while, but if we are fighting abroad, we'll want to train as many soldiers as possible. Spring is here in the year 560. The Fortress of Chanted Fins is now a full decade old, and how it has grown. The tower is climbing higher and higher. Above the Church of Lust, Zasit has dedicated a floor of the tower to a new set of dwellings for Sarvesh Takudkabuk, first mage of the Putrid Doctrines. The first mage's throne room features some basalt coffins and a large gem window. It sparkles with red and black zircons. Sarvesh likes coffins and gems. The room was constructed with his own interests in mind. Perhaps Zasit hopes to ingratiate herself with the faith. They certainly hold a lot of power in Chanted Fins. However, Sarvesh is not easily swayed by material concerns. His loyalty is to the divine. Of course, our mayor is preparing some rather more impressive property for herself higher up the tower. She has had the dwarves construct her a vast throne room. Her gem-encrusted gold throne sits before a huge crystal glass window, two stories tall. This room is still under construction and needs some more furnishings. 
Further up, the dwarves build the tower yet higher. Zasit has been seen discussing construction plans at length with some of our scholars. Who knows what they have planned for this huge monument. A few months pass, and our militia dwarves get another chance to prove their worth in combat. The forgotten beast Sumaje has come, an enormous quadruped composed of mud. It has large mandibles and it has a bloated body. Beware its webs. Its ability to web our dwarves makes Sumaje a serious threat, though being made of mud, it should fall quickly to ranged attacks. Unfortunately, we don't have time to wait for our marks dwarves to reach the caves. Most of our rhinoceros calves are penned up down there. Raising another herd would take years. We need to move in and take down that beast now. The pious hand, our cavern squad, will have to deal with Sumaje themselves. Here comes the forgotten beast. And down it goes. The pious hand fought well and took down the creature before it managed to ensnare the squad with webs. It's always a relief to see our soldiers fight off a forgotten beast without any casualties. The creature was decapitated by Sodel Kelmomus, an axe dwarf. He's a brave, modest, humble pessimist. His hair is sepia. After Sodel's courageous slaying of Sumaje, a rather messy affair, the dwarves have begun calling him Mudbeard. Construction continues relentlessly for months, until an untimely death rocks the fortress. One of our butchers has been found in his room, completely drained of blood. But this murder is no mystery. You see, in her dealings with the fortress's scholars, Zasit has already begun suspecting one of our dwarves. The astronomer Sarol hasn't been seen eating, drinking, or sleeping since she entered the fortress. This incident confirms Zasit's suspicions. Sarol is a vampire. But Zasit won't be so hasty to have this one executed. You see, Sarol is going to be instrumental in Zasit's academic endeavors. This discovery simply gives our mayor more leverage in ensuring Sarol does what's expected of her. For now, the vampire will be confined to quarters. In the meantime, let's see if we can reanimate the unfortunate butcher who was so rudely exsanguinated. Ah, excellent. Uvash the Butcher has been raised as a Dwarf Butcher Wasting Stalker. I'm sure he'll make a fine member of the Gilded Grave someday. Zasit and her new thrall have met up in the throne room, where she's granting him citizenship. The hall is now fully furnished. The tower grows more impressive by the day. We're working on Zasit's bedroom and dining room now. The mayor's six-year-old boy, Curseborn, plays make-believe with a toy axe in their new quarters. The repeated deaths and reanimations of the child's parents don't seem to be getting him down. Above Zasit's quarters, the dwarves begin work on the final room of the tower. But there's still much to do. The upper floor of the tower will be the most complex, and will need to be built to the exact calculations of our scholars. Still, we're in the final stretch. In a few months, the tower will be complete. But a major distraction threatens our timeline, and the lives of our dwarves. The forgotten beast Omethurofa has come. An enormous, eyeless serpent. It has a square shell, and it squirms and fidgets. Its dark chestnut scales are oval-shaped and set far apart. Beware, it's fire. The snake is in the far southeast corner of the cavern, but I think it can reach us. We're going to try and call our rhinos up to the surface and deploy our military just inside the fortress entrance. Fighting it on top of flammable cave fungus would be extremely dangerous. Here comes the creature. It's actually swimming through a lava tube. It's not immune to the heat either. The creature is covered in blood, its fat melting away. But somehow, Omethurofa survived and is barreling onward. Luckily, our rhinos are really quite fast, and they all quickly evacuated the cavern. Here comes Omethurofa. Bolts fly and smoke fills the room. It's hard to tell what's going on. But after some fighting, Omethurofa lies dead. It looks like the beast was killed by one of our wasting stalkers, who launched it against a wall with force magic. Two of our soldiers were regrettably lost in the encounter, their bodies burnt away to nothing by Omethurofa's scorching breath. The serpent's corpse continues to burn for some time after the beast is felled. In any case, let's hope that will be the last distraction for a while. We're rather anxious to finish construction. But construction work is not without its own risks. A section of the structure we're working on has collapsed. This is very dangerous for our workers, we're quite high up. The dwarves tumble down a couple of floors. Luckily nobody fell all the way down the tower. 
Most are just a little dazed, but one miner was killed, and a mechanic took a really bad fall. We still have work to do, though. Zasit resurrects our miner down in the crypt. No sleeping on the job. We'll patch them up and send them back to work. It's now autumn, 561, in the twelfth year of the fortress. The dwarves have been working on this tower for many years. We've excavated enormous amounts of stone from our obsidian mine, carved it, hauled it, and built with it. It has taken a great deal of time and work, but we can finally say that the structure is complete. We can now reveal the purpose of this huge building. This is the Chanted Finn's Observatory, a great stone dome fitted with the most impressive feat of optics engineering the world has ever known. Mounted within is a huge iron tube filled with lenses and mirrors. We can use it to peer into the heavens and see in great detail the astral bodies that light up the night sky. Zasit is a very curious person, so when she was approached by our optics engineer and our astronomer about building this wondrous machine, she couldn't refuse. We'll be able to use this invention to learn much about the cosmos and the nature of the universe, perhaps even gaining insight into the gods themselves. With this utterly unique structure, Chanted Fins will become a bastion of knowledge. We hold the secrets of life and death, and we will soon learn the secrets of the stars as well. There is another, less academic use for this new invention. As our fortress has grown, we have attracted more and more attention from the goblins. Perhaps we can use our telescope to peer towards enemy settlements and gain some bits of tactical insight. Operating our new equipment will be Serol the Vampire Astronomer. The entire upper floor of the observatory will be her personal library, where she can research the stars. She'll of course be locked up in there so she doesn't get distracted from her work by the temptation of a midnight snack. First though, we'll need to get her into the tower, which means sending her through the fortress. It's a bit worrying as we can't be sure she won't attack another dwarf en route. Damn it, she immediately went to a dwarf's room and started feeding. I'm not sure what we can do to stop this. Yes, Sorol drained the poor dwarf dry. We'll simply have to try to resurrect them. For the love of Tig, she's heading straight to another sleeping dwarf. This won't do at all. Maybe we can restrict her to a burrow to stop her? No, she's drinking her fill again. Down goes another dwarf. Well, at least she's heading up to the observatory now. These were tragic, but necessary losses. We need this astronomer. Those dwarves will be just as useful as wasting stalkers anyway. Sorol is in the observatory now, so we are evacuating the rest of the dwarves and locking the hatch. She can now spend an eternity working on scholarly pursuits. Because of her interest in the sky and her late night improprieties, the dwarves have given Sorol the nickname Blood Moon. With the completion of the observatory, Chanted Fins begins a new chapter in its history. We're about to learn so much about the stars, the gods, and our enemies. Chanted Fins is becoming a place of faith and scholarship, of worship and warfare, of life and death. The dwarves of Chanted Fins are about to uncover secrets that no one else has ever known, and perhaps ones that no one ever should. But it's getting late, and I must retire. Come find me again some other night, and hear more tales of the erudite dwarves of Chanted Fins. Before we go, I thought it might be a good idea to give some out-of-character explanations for this episode. Seasoned Dwarf Fortress players may have noticed a couple of odd things this time around. First, the Ballista. In normal Dwarf Fortress, siege weapons like the Ballista are pretty limited. You can only fire them in a straight line, in the four cardinal directions, and the projectiles never change elevation. They're a holdover from before the game was 3D and haven't been updated since. However, I use a quality of life mod called Dwarf Fortress Hack, or DF Hack. It has lots of little UI improvements, but also comes with a hidden Siege Engine plugin that makes ballistas far more interesting and useful. By pressing Alt-A while selecting the Siege Engine, DF Hack lets you open a menu to more precisely control the weapon, allowing you to target units in any direction, as long as there's no obstruction in the way. Some might consider this cheating, and yeah, I guess it technically makes the game easier by giving you another defensive option, but I think it's pretty well balanced and makes the game more interesting, and that's what matters to me. If you'd like to install DF Hack, I've included a link in the description. It should also be packaged with the Lazy Noob Pack out the gate if you use that. The second matter is the telescope. Now let me make this clear, there is no telescope mechanic in Dwarf Fortress. 
That telescope I built isn't actually functional in terms of game mechanics, and it won't actually do anything in the game. Astronomy is a skill scholars can have in the game, though, and the discoveries they make do imply that they have access to some kind of astronomy equipment like telescopes, so I figured it was fair game for roleplay. I'm going to use the observatory as a framing device for some exploration into dwarven religion and philosophy, and looking into other settlements, but since it's entirely roleplay with no gameplay basis, I'll try not to go too overboard on it. And finally, the upload schedule. This video had the longest wait of any Dwarf Fortress video I've made, well over three months. I've had a pretty weird few months in light of recent world events, and long story short I had to move out of my previous living situation. I've learned that I'm notoriously bad at sticking to an upload schedule of any kind, so I won't give any promises about when the next one will come out, but tentatively, I'd like to upload a shorter, sort of Halloweenish episode before the end of October. But that could easily fall through, don't hold your breath. In any case, I do really enjoy making these videos, and I fully intend to keep it up. Thanks to everyone who has said kind words in the comments, I really do appreciate it. So, until next time, sleep well.